you know, as I said, we have this august audience here. So um, uh, what, I, what I think I'll try to do is um, discuss a few points of, you know, sort of the, uh, some of the questions of epistemology or methodology that come up that Lynn has raised, actually somewhat he raised in his last paper, uh, at the, not really the last full paper, the paper um, that's in the briefing today, where uh, in the concluding section that we have, I, I, we were told today that he finished the article, but I, don't, I haven't seen what's added. But if you take today's briefing, the last couple of paragraphs, Lynn refers to this idea that there's sort of three schools of uh, human ideas or human out outlook on humanity. One is the is what is Lynn is what Lynn is represents. You know the Pythagoreans, Plato, Cusa, Leibniz, Riemann, uh, etc. I'm not going to try to name them all. I'm sure I'll forget somebody. Um, up through uh, Einstein and Vernadsky, and then he he identifies two kinds of enemy that have a kind of hereditary relationship. And in some way, what I might try to go through is a little bit of what that hereditary relationship is and how it's, it functions. One is the school of Aristotle and Euclid, uh, which, you know, and I'll, some of you have heard some of this, but some of you haven't, so I'll, I, I'll run the risk of repeating myself. I always say one of the things about Lynn is he always repeats himself over and over again because he does know that sometimes it takes a lot of repetition, um, particularly with a certain generation of people. But I think with everybody at a certain level. So, um, and then it, there's a certain twist in this that comes with Sarpy and Occam. And, um, and I think, you know, you get a certain repeat of this. One way to look at it is if you think of Kant as a neo-Aristotelian. Uh, as one kind of resurfacing, because Kant was a, an attack on Leibniz. I don't want to overdo the parallel, but I will go through the idea of Aristotle as an explicit contradiction or attack on Plato, not a, a kind of intentional misunderstanding of Plato that's been foisted upon you know, some 2,500 succeeding years. Um, and uh, the, 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 the Sarpy, Occam, it's really Sarpy. I mean, Sarpy simply resurrected Occam, who was otherwise a somewhat forgotten figure. He was, he was resurrected for Sarpy's purposes. And then you get Kant versus Leibniz. And at the end of the 19th century, you get this positivist tradition, which itself takes sort of two forms. One is Hilbert. Really, and, I, and I'll go through some of the predecessors to Hilbert. And this, this is a work in progress. I mean, I, I looked at Hilbert uh, from one particular standpoint many, many years ago, as they say, before most of you were born. Um, uh, and then more recently, but there's, there's a lot more material to look at uh, that I haven't looked at um, and I'm uh, trying to get to. But one of the elements of Hilbert, just to jump ahead, and then you, after Hilbert, you get Russell. Now, there's a funny irony in this. I mean, Russell, in a sense, claims to be carrying out Hilbert's project. And Hilbert was one of these guys that outlined a number of projects for mathematics and philosophy and so forth at the end of the 19th century and at, uh, really in the first quarter of the 20th century, which is part and parcel of a lot of the epistemology that we live under. In other words, at the moment, the dominant or the hegemonic epistemological outlook is the outlook of you know, information theory, artificial intelligence, uh, bizarre versions of evolution, which are called Darwinism, or things related to Darwinism. Uh, which basically all, in, in and in I think uh, a deeply encompassing way, in a certain sense, you have to look deep enough into the pit to uh, know how sharp the fight is 
and how important the fight is. Because I would not, I'm not trying to uh, convey pessimism. That's not my point. My point is that if we know how deeply entrenched the enemy is on certain things, and then we have an idea of how important what we're doing is and that we not waver on it. And I think yeah, some of what I want to get across is don't waver on these epistemological points. They're not minor points. They are uh, ultimately the determining points. You know, Lynn's point uh, in some of his recent work is that we have to win the cultural battle. For example, if we're going to do the Mars moon project, we're not just offering people a lot of jobs and say, well, here's a bunch of high paying jobs and we can get to Mars, you know, that's also part of the deal. The idea is that the concept of human beings leaving the planet, which itself is a jolt to the sense of identity. You know, think about it. There's a reason we could think of it as Mother Earth. The idea of leaving Mother <laughs> is not an easy one. You won't think of it as Father Earth. No one would say Father Earth. You might say, dear Father, help me. But you never say Father Earth. Gaia is a Mother Earth conception. The Earth is associated with fertility, right? So the idea of leaving the planet, number one, is a shock. And I, I think sometimes it's worth thinking, what was it like for most of these people? I'm not just talking about the explorers. What was it like for people to get on a boat in 1620 or 1610 or 1630 and leave everything behind and go to a place where you, know, you don't know anything. I mean, it, one way to look at this question of time, and I think, don't mystify it. There, there's things to think about. It's, maybe it's a little awe-inspiring, but don't mystify it. Like, if you left Europe in 1620, and you left your family somewhere in the Netherlands or Great Britain or whatever, how long did it take you to communicate back to your family that you had arrived in North America? Weeks. How long did it take for them to reply to you so that you knew that they received the letter and knew where you were? Weeks, at least. Maybe months, depending on the weather. So you may be out of touch with everything you grew up with for six weeks. You may not know whether they knew you existed anymore. So there are, th there are interesting things to think about, about how long these things took, what the relationship was between people, what the relationship was to the economy, when things took weeks and weeks to deliver, where you sort of had to live off of things that were in your immediate environment where the cost of transportation, at least as a percentile of the population, was enormous. I mean, think of how much went into shipping mail across the Atlantic Ocean or even across chunks of the United States. You know, one of the things about uh, rail is that you have a funny paradox in, in this idea of maritime culture. It, it, there's, there's, there's an implicit advantage which could not be taken of inland development until we had the scientific technological basis to do it. And that is that while the problem with ocean, uh, the, the, one of the advantages of ocean transportation versus land transportation is ease of transportation. In other words, if you're going across a continent, you have you know, mountains, rivers, and a tremendous frictional cost in transportation. You can't uh, move across certain areas. Uh, you can't build connections. The one, while, while maritime travel may be relatively slow, it's nonetheless consistent and relatively uh, measurable. And this is where you get into astrogation and so on and so forth. But you have a big problem, which is you can't build populations on oceans or seas. In other words, you're going from one part of the Mediterranean to the other, but as you cross that area, you, there's nothing there that you can build a population on. 
you can't live in the middle of the Mediterranean, let alone offshore Atlantic, Indian Ocean, et cetera, et cetera. The advantage of the development of inland civilization is you can build development corridors. You can expand population. And you can therefore develop uh, relatively shorter communication lines. Now, of course, this becomes different when you get to the 19th and 20th century. So you, you get an, an entire change, or beginning of an entire change, in human self-conception. Minimally, we become a global population, a civilization that's in communication with other civilizations. It went on before. But now we're opening up whole new areas. Now, what happens when we go into the solar system? We're actually looking at what was it that created the planet Earth? You know, it, it, people make a big deal about the planet Earth is in exactly the right place to support human life. Now, you know, it's, it's not too hot and not too cold and not too wet and not too dry. And, you know, it's like uh, Goldilocks's porridge. It's just right. <laughs> and, it, you know, it happened that way. Now, actually, what Lynn is getting at is that the structure of the solar system is anti-entropic. So you have to look at the entire solar system to see what is the organization of the solar system as a whole that meant that there was a planet there. And that now that human population can spread that human life to the rest of the solar system. Now, just to give you an idea about this, you know, some of you may know some of this, but at this point, there have been presuming these things are right, and I, I don't have any reason to think they're completely wrong, there have been something like 300 other planetary systems identified out in interstellar space. Now, they do this by certain kinds of measurements, which, again, we have to maybe make sure they're 100% right. But I, I have no reason to believe there isn't something there. They, they do it by the wobble. You know, in other words, if you watch a, a star and you get a certain fluctuation in the light that you receive, or there's a fluctuation in some of the other signals that come from the planet, you can calculate from the sun, solar, uh, the star, you can calculate that there's a planet near that star, or somewhere in that, uh, around that star. In fact, some, in some recent cases, though these are, I, I think, only a few relatively recent cases, we've actually been able to track the transit of the, of the planet across the sun. That was actually a, a breakthrough with the Hubble recently. Okay? But most of the time, what they're doing is they're taking measurements of fluctuation in, in received light and so on and so forth. Now, as far as we can tell, in all of those cases, though there are some fun anomalies, in all of those cases, the planet that's being witnessed is generally a giant gaseous planet you know, relatively close to its star. In some cases, it almost looks like a double star system. But these are giant planets, at least the size of Jupiter, and in many cases, five and 10 times the size of Jupiter. Their orbits are usually very rapid. And by all accounts, there's no way these things could, as they say, support life as we know it, at least in its present form, without some other intervention. Now, there, there is an interesting case that they've discovered fairly recently, which has an anomaly, which is that uh, the planet is very close to its star, relatively large, though, though not as big as some of the other ones. And it orbits the, the star in a day, in, a, in an Earth day, which is pretty rapid. Now, by all calculations, this planet should not be able to exist. It's too close. The effect of the solar wind should have blown this planet apart sometime in the last few million years or something along those lines. Now, I say that to give you an idea. The organization of our solar system is not some kind of you know, normal phenomena. It's not something that every time we find a planetary system, it's going to have the kind of configuration that we have. That's partly why Lynn uh, keeps referring to the fact that the, uh, on the Ceres project, that the asteroid belt is the signature 
of the anti-entropic nature of the solar system. Now, the reason I think he's saying this is because if you look at the harmonies and some of the work that was done by the, by the people that did the website and so on and so forth, if you look at the harmonies, the key to the solar system, to the developmental aspect of the solar system, lies in the asteroid belt, where indeed you have a potential harmonic ordering in the asteroid belt that does not happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is because the, uh, what, what appears to be the case is that in the tuning of all of the solar system to that asteroid belt, that's where you find the problem. It's not that there isn't a harmonic point in the asteroid belt. It's that in the tuning of the asteroid belt to the rest of the solar system, the harmonies would not, the, the, you, you have problems that go beyond the comma or the diesis and so on and so forth. Now, therefore, it's the precise harmonic ordering of the, our solar system that both gives you the asteroid belt, and the asteroid belt is the signature of the nature of the harmonies of the solar system. So, it, it, and this produces human life on the third planet out in, in the solar system. Now, now we take the point of us going to Mars. And of course, Lynn uh, and some of the work, and some people may know more about this that was discussed on Saturday. Um, if we're going to go out into the solar system in any livable form, and I think it was, it was useful that the point was made, it's not just the obvious point, but it, that's a point. In other words, if, you, if you're going to go out there in chemically propelled rockets, and you're going to undertake essentially an inertial orbit, which means basically you're flying at a constant speed. That's worth keeping in mind here, because we're going to get back to this point of constant speeds, accelerated speeds. And what about accelerated rates of acceleration? Because one point I'm going to try to make is even though we're not awed by the speeds, sometimes I think the numbers catch our mind, um, human economic development is characterized by an accelerating rate of acceleration. We're not just operating at 1G. So you, you know, you're at about whatever it is, what is it, 32 feet per second squared? A, a rate of the, the acceleration in the, gravita in the Earth's gravitational field. So to get to 1G, you'd have to have a constant rate of acceleration. And who knows, maybe we could get away with slightly less. But what you're looking at in an economy is not just acceleration. You're looking at an accelerated rate of acceleration. In other words, you're not accelerating at the same speed. You're accelerating at an accelerating rate. Now that means if an accelerated frame of reference is the equivalent of a gravitational field from the standpoint of general relativity, then it's an interesting question, what's an accelerated rate, what's, what's, what is a frame of reference that's accelerating at an accelerating rate? Now, um, that's an economy. We don't have that in general in terms of what we're dealing with. Uh, I, I don't know what it would take to do that with, um, with propulsion. But what we do have is besides what's been said, and it is true, by the way, um, uh, if you stay in a uh, zero gravity condition long enough, you know, your muscles go to pot, they go to atrophy, your bones uh, uh, weaken beyond, you know, beyond anything you can do anything about. No amount of simple exercise is going to compensate for it. Uh, the bones just deteriorate. Bone growth, I mean, uh, contrary to what people think, bones are not, so, not solid material the way people think about it. There's very little in the world that's solid material in the way people, I don't know if there's anything. That there are things that are dense, like diamonds or neutron stars, are dense, 
but they're not immobile. Now, bones might, are, are actually constantly changing. They're constantly changing, uh, exchanging cells, and they're in constant motion. In fact, in the course of a day, most people lose a certain amount of height. Now, most of that is the compression of the spinal cord from gravity. OK, as you get older, it gets worse. Some of it is just even a small, minimal fraction of it is just the compression of the bone structure. OK, so there's, there's a loss of bone density. But as was pointed out, there's more than that. We're, we're, we exist in a gravitational field, in a, in a, and we exist within a certain electromagnetic domain, both in terms of things that are affecting us and in terms of things we're protected by. The atmosphere protects us. The, uh, the heliopause protects us. That's why uh, this was raised on Saturday. When, when, when the sunspots are weakened or limited in output, the heliopause, the amount of cosmic, the amount of radiation that's put out by the sun diminishes. And when that diminishes, the amount of protection from various other forms of electromagnetic radiation decreases and we're bombarded. Now obviously when you go out into interstellar space, some of that protection is gone. Moreover, there are certain things that clearly affect us in a positive sense in terms of low, low intensity radiation and so on and so forth that are essential to the way in which the physical organism works. As we know that, for example, there are isotopes in the human body that function at a certain level. They don't, they're not going to function necessarily under all conditions. And we don't know all these things. A lot of this we don't know. So you have to do various forms of experiments and so on and so forth. Then the other element of this is that we are living in a reference frame, or we're living in a, in a system which is the equivalent of a gravitational system, an artificially created gravitational system such that we're living from the standpoint of an accelerated frame of reference with respect to other gravitational frames. We've added something to our relationship to the solar system. Now, this means that we're going to have to think in terms of, because of its relationship to electromagnetic effects, radiation, and so on and so forth, we're going to have to think in terms of, on a, an experimental basis, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, what does it mean to live in a newly created relativistic frame of reference? So in a sense, Lynn's point, I think, is we might push people towards a type B kind of personality because they're going to have to, in effect, act a lot more like people looking for universal principles, people looking for the larger issues determining how they're living. It becomes an immediate day-to-day -day part of their lives. In other words, you know, we become less like rocks. You know, think about it. You know, uh, there, there's all kinds of funny things about time, which Vernadsky talks about. Rocks, a lot of prebiotic phenomena don't age at a very slow rate, or at least uh, uh, as far as we can tell most of the time. In other words, a rock erodes, but it might take hundreds or thousands of years. If you look at uh, the kinds of things, uh, cosmic particles that float around in interstellar space, a lot of them last for, who knows, millions, hundreds of millions in some cases. You know, I saw one estimate for the life of a proton or a photon, I forget which one, which was in the billions of years. A single uh, proton or, uh, can be tracked, supposedly. We can guess at its lifespan, given its nature, and the fact that it's coming at us from God knows where, that these things last for billions of years in essentially a stable form. Okay. On the other hand, if you look at subatomic phenomena, like the kinds of things you get in accelerators, where you do this funny experiment, I don't know, where you, know, you, you take two particles and you accelerate them to near light speed and you crash them together, you get quite an interesting phenomenon. I, you know, it, it's a little bit, 
I used to think of it a little bit like dropping an atomic bomb on a horse to figure out what made the horse up, you know. Um, the, uh, uh, but there is some, but you get things that last for what? A billionth of a second? Or even less, you know, 10 to the minus 9th, or 10 to the minus 12th, whatever. Now, there's two interesting things about that. First of all, what is the existence of something that lives for, or that exists, it doesn't live, but exists for 10 to the minus 12 seconds? They, we can use the number. It's not an easy thing to, as they say, get your mind around. But it's not science fiction. Now, on the other hand, there is a funny relativistic issue that comes up, which is given that from the standpoint of special relativity, the faster you are, the slower the time goes, just to use a rough expression of it. How long does the particle live from the standpoint of the particle? Well, it's not 10 to the minus 12 seconds. It, I don't know what the calculations would be, but it's, it's not quite that instantaneous. Now, wh what does it mean to begin to look at the world a little bit that way? That's also an interesting question. Now, these things may end up being important. These things may be, end up being important in us looking at what in the prebiotic and people have done some crazy things on this stuff. So, you know, so I'm not, but what in the prebiotic makes the prebiotic susceptible of being utilized by a principle of life? Now, there have been a lot of wacky stuff on this, you know, I think, even from some, you know, uh, a lot of these guys come up with this idea that there's a quantum effect, i.e., the randomness at the quantum level is a kind of mimicking of development in life or even freedom, which is something I might get to if we, if we stay on this somewhat bizarre track. But anyway, the, um, uh, um, you know, what kinds of phenomena are working together in the prebiotic to allow the prebiotic, or at least some of the prebiotic, to be part of life? We know that isotopes play a role, which means there are, there are relatively small electromagnetic responses that change the way an element acts within life. It can be, it can be enzymatic or not enzymatic. In other words, it can accelerate a, a process or it can not contribute anything to the process. It can be deleterious to the process. And these are, these are slight changes in things like what's the magnetic moment of the particle, in other words, the, the, amount, of, the amount and the uh, orientation of the magnetic, uh, electromagnetic effect of the particle, and so on and so forth. Now, these are things that one might begin to be able to experiment with and look at in a different setting, for example, either on a different planet or experiments on accelerated frames of reference and so on and so forth. So we're setting into motion an entirely different relationship to the universe, to the events in the universe, to the effects of the universe, and of course to our power over the universe. You know, there is a, there's another thing in terms of potentialities. For example, there was a recent study that claims that we're about to reach the point where probably 10% or more of the people born today at least have the ability to live 100 years. And certainly the number of people that live to be 100 years old now, or certainly 90, is huge compared to the past. In other words, what does this mean in terms of a different measure of time? What does it mean in terms of human life? Think about the difference, and think about what we're dealing with now in terms of the Obama health care policy. People that retire now at the age of 60 or 65. In some of these cases, people are retiring at the age of 50 or something because they think that's wonderful. But um, what happens? Now, it was one thing when people, and I'm not now talking about cost benefit. I'm talking about something else. It was one thing when people re retired at 65 and had an expected lifespan of, let's say, another five or 10 years, where most people were living into the early 70s. Now, today, even with the problems we have, 
the average, let's say, male in the United States lives into the late 70s, 78. I've seen different figures, 77, 78, 79. Women generally live until 82, 84. There are some places like Japan where women live to be over 85, on average, if you get past the first year of life. Now, that means that you're spending 20 to maybe 30 years in retirement. Roughly a third of your life in retirement as compared to previously maybe it was a tenth of your life. So what if we looked at this differently than this cost-benefit analysis? First of all, what does it take to also make that, that lifespan healthy? But the real issue is how much actual potential productive labor do we have? If we think of productive labor as the mental power of the population, the ability of the population to absorb and utilize newly developed scientific capabilities, what's the actual potential capability of the population? Because you know, it's, it doesn't require you to run up and down 20 flights of stairs to be productive in, if we're in an, an increasingly developing technologically developed uh, economy. Ironically enough, this is what we would be producing if we were putting blue collar workers to work now. Because most people think of that as manual. I think most people when you say blue collar, they think of manual, you know, assembly line. That's not true. Blue collar workers are actually, generally speaking, in many areas, the relatively more skilled part of the population. In fact, in part, because they have to work around machinery, electronic machinery, uh, combustion engines, uh, and so on and so forth, chemical processes, construction. You can't have people working with that kind of material who don't have a certain modest level of education, high school or even a couple of years of community college. Increasingly, for example, today, even in things like tractors, trucks, you're dealing with computer technologies, and so on and so forth, you cannot have an illiterate workforce. This is an illusion. This is this idea of cheap labor. But if you put cheap labor to work at the scientific and technological level, we would need to build proper rail systems. For example, to build a high-speed rail, you need special uh, capabilities on laying rail. You can't have rail that's off by tolerances that are normal for frictional rail. If you try to go 300 to 400 kilometers an hour on the kind of rail uh, you know, ties that we have now, these trains are not going to stay on the ground, or they're not going to stay on the rail. You've got to have much lower tolerances. You're going to be using laser technologies. You're going to be laying steel beams that are much longer than the ones are now, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, and this is one thing I think that we have to, we're not going to do it all on our, on our own. But we have to look at the fact that you do need this concept of productive activity. You do need to have a sense of what you really need to do this. You know, for example, if we're going to do this kind of thing in the third world, we're going to have to have a process of rapid developmental education to bring, even, uh, to bring the labor force into the capability of using the capital goods we're going to hopefully export to them, and they're going to begin to build themselves. So you have to have a sense of how do you carry out that kind of education on a near emergency basis. Yeah, and then you realize, you see, to a certain extent, the questions posed to our organization in terms of Monge Brigades, in terms of how do you incorporate, let's say, new generations of members that mean maybe a five or an eight year difference in age. I mean, a generation is normally 20 to 25 years. But in a certain sense, if you're recruiting youth to these kinds of ideas, there's a turnover that's more like five or 10 years. You, know, it, you, you go through the process of developing uh, a, a, an educational capability, let's say over five or 10 years, in a group of newer organizers. But they, they, there, they're going to be bringing in a new group who are going to have to go through a similar five or 10 year process. Maybe you want to accelerate it. But that's not dissimilar from the problem we have in bringing new technologies and new science and development to the globe as a whole. 
and we're going to need that much of a labor force to carry out a Mars project. I mean, this is minimally going to be something that involves, you know, five or ten nations in terms of productive scale if you look at what we're really talking about. We're not talking about sending one guy to the moon. I mean, that was a project I'm not denigrating, but that was one of the problems with it. When we got there, you know, I have often said that, you know, people often say, well, this is competition with the Soviet Union. Okay, you know, at one level, but that's not the worst kind of competition. It's better than dropping bombs on each other <laughs> or fighting proxy wars in some distant country. So it's not the worst thing to demonstrate your capabilities by, by getting to the moon. But the problem was it, was it was by too many people viewed as an expensive one-shot idea. We got there, we won, we planted our flag, the game over. And particularly when the Soviets decided they weren't going to stay in the competition, so to speak. So we gave it up. We gave it up for all the wrong reasons. But what happens when you're talking about the kind of thing that, you know, you, uh, uh, Ferner von Braun or uh, Kraft Erika were talking about, about building cities on the moon, building industrial complexes that then become the launching pa pad for terraforming Mars. And it is the case that these represent the great benefits that would come to the, uh, to the planet Earth. So these are, these are the kinds of things that we're looking at. Now, you have to recognize that the existing oligarchical forces, and we've seen this, don't want this to happen. Now, it's not just that they don't like progress. They don't want it to happen because they fear precisely the required changes in the population. That is, in the simplest sense, uh, yeah, and Lynn has put it this way at times, if, if you develop a population with a level of education, intelligence, mission orientation, probably really more than anything else, that, we have, that the population has the independent capability to carry out a mission of opening up vast new frontiers for humanity, expanding human knowledge, increasing standards of living, then why would they need the oligarchy? In other words, it would dawn on people. They don't need people at uh, Goldman Sachs and uh, Bear Stern and whatever to uh, guide them through their life. They wouldn't need it. And that's the great battle. And in a sense, that is the great war. That is the great epistemological battle. Why would the oligarchy be so intent on the idea that we're just like animals, or that we're just like machines, or, or otherwise you, you might have a religious belief that there's something else about you, but th that's for some great mystery in the sky somewhere. That's for some great mystical moment, or that moment when you meet your maker and you find out that there's some judgment being made of you. And you're going to save up all your gold stars for that moment. OK? Why? Because they, they recognize that if we had a population with a sense of mission orientation that would say we can develop and control human life and expand the power of human individuals in society over their circumstances, then they don't need the oligarchy. And I'll tell you, in, in a certain level, this goes to this, again, this, I find this question of credit versus monetary. A credit system means that a, a, a society controls its destiny, controls its future, controls its fate. You issue currency based on a set, a set of projects that are determined by a political discourse to represent the means to accomplishing some future mission that's required for the development of society. We need nuclear energy, or we need the Mars Moon Project, or we need the, the Eurasian Land Bridge. And we're going we're to we're take that as our purpose. 
Therefore, we're going to issue credit, which can then be monetized at the proper rate of growth of the accomplishment of that mission. And, that, and that's the sovereign currency over which we rule. We therefore determine our fate, our relationship to the future. Credit is the future. What's the monetarist outlook? The future is determined by the present value of monetary instruments or financial instruments held by some degree of ownership, some degree of financial control. It can be fundy, it can be uh, you know, groupings of oligarchical forces who say, the value of my financial instruments and the money, really the value of the money value I ascribe to those instruments in the present as my control determines the future. Because I issue credit on that basis. And I can issue money against my money as I please. And you have to do what's necessary to maintain the value of that money. So we mean literally a society run by monet monetary considerations above all, which means the present and to a certain degree the past, i.e. The, the existing financial values. The, think, of, think of what a, the bailout was, right? We have certain financial values on the books. We're going to issue money to guarantee those values and that those values essentially don't drop. Or if they do drop, I control the majority of, of what's left. I increase my power. So that's monetarism versus a credit system, where money has a value only as it's issued with respect to the development of a project or a mission orientation. And the nation controls as a general welfare concept the mission and the development of that credit. And this includes, of course, the development of living standards, educational, and so forth. See, I think one of the things, if I, if I can get at, and one of the things I want to do is leave time for any, any kinds of questions that people have. But one of the things I want to get at is, look, it's all, I'm not denigrating, and I'm certainly not trying to put off, questions about certain kinds of details. But what I do find is we, we let the enemy get inside our head a little bit too much. It's a little bit like, you know, the mass strike is over because somebody yelled at us at a book table. <laughs> now, uh, you know, uh, these book tables, look, these book tables are a little scary. I'm not, uh, you know, I don't minimize the physical threat that has hit some of our members. Uh, and, I, and I don't denigrate it. But you have to be tough on one point. It may be that somebody freaked out. And there are a lot of people freaking out. There's a lot of instability in the population. There's a lot of volatility, and there's a certain amount of just sheer craziness. But, and here's a perfect case, a, a freaked out person, many of whom are sent, probably more than we think, okay, but probably more than I even thought. I thought a lot of them were sent, but I'm, I'm becoming more and more convinced that more of them are sent or provoked, okay? But what, what happens, this is a pure, you know, What's a, you could say type A. You go out, there's a mass strike. You say, well, people are doing this. I saw it on off the cuff or whatever. I, I, Lynn said it, there's a mass strike. I saw the Copenhagen sign. Mm -hmm. Then you go out and somebody, you know, turns the table over, rips up the Obama sign, and calls you every name under the sun, and maybe even physically threatens you. And you say, whoops, the mass strike is over. <laughs> You see, they turned against us. There's no mass strike. First of all, the mass strike was never for us. The mass strike is a phenomenon. It means that people, are, what, what really is at issue in the mass strike, as I understand what Luxembourg had to say, is the population is organized in a certain unitary fashion against, recognizes that its own government is organizing against it that the system has failed. They're not, they're not striking for an issue. They're not striking for a particular gain or a particular group. Implicitly, they're striking for 
the entirety of society, even if they're not totally aware of it. Which is Shelley's point, which we often fudge about. A lot of times people don't really know why they're doing what they're doing. They find themselves shocked. Because these are, these are principles. These are social forces. And so what happens is it appears that this has slowed down. But indeed, it hasn't. It may be entering a different phase. But indeed, the mass strike still exists. That, that principle is still operative because the system is dead, and it's out to kill them. And they do have to face it. And this affects, this ripples through society on the negative side. People know that some relative of theirs is not going to be taken care of. Or they're going to face unemployment. This thing of 5 million newly unemployed is a big deal. And then you drop into it this thing with Obama going to Copenhagen, a relatively unimportant thing that becomes important. Because the, it, it demonstrates what a damn fool he is, what a damn egotistical fool that he could fall into that kind of trap. Now, the fact of the matter is, what's operative are universal principles. So we don't, we have to stick in some way to that. Not that we don't have to answer questions. But it's not as though we have to tell somebody how, what standards are going to have for each bank that's going to be closed or opened. And you know, how much bad paper do they have to have before we shut them down? And what do their books have to look like? And what's going to happen to my you know, CD or something? We, what we have to do is get across, this is going to operate on a principle. Now, I, I read this earlier in the day. I've read it to people before. But it just stands out to me. Because you know, people ask a million and one detailed questions about the New Deal, FDR. And you know, some of them are legit. But because they, there's a curiosity that it's OK to answer, don't get me wrong. But in the end, you have to come to the following. The whole New Deal, the whole saving of the United States from fascism, all of it, every detail of it, rested on the following. What was it that moved Roosevelt in the New Deal? How was he thinking? And this is why I think. You know, not, I think, I don't know how much it affects people, but Roosevelt was not a pragmatic guy who was just trying to, you know, get through the political mess and so forth. He knew what he was doing. And I'm not saying he was a, I'm not saying he was a philosophical, epistemological thinker as such. But he operated on principle. And I do think there may be more to him intellectually than he's often given credit for. You know, the, he, the, Oliver Wendell Holmes had this famous thing about him. A first-rate temperament and a second-rate mind. Uh, I think it, you know he meant that as both a compliment and a not so much of a compliment. But you know, I, I think frankly, it's wrong. It may be that that it, it's not it's not always clear how how it expressed itself. But for example, Roosevelt was a great student of geography. He was uh, uh, knew the topography of most of the world. And so when he, when he would fly over places, he would talk about how you could shape it, how you could irrigate it, how you could run transportation lines, how you could integrate all of North Africa. This is what happened when he flew to Casablanca, and so on and so forth. So what does he say in uh, these public papers? He writes the introduction to most of the volumes this, uh, that I know of. There's 13 volumes. But this is volume two. So he's covering the year 1933. And he says, the New Deal was fundamentally intended as a modern expression of ideals set forth 150 years ago in the preamble of the Constitution of the United States. Quote, a more perfect union, justice, domestic tranquility, the common defense, the general welfare, and the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. That was the New Deal. The New Deal wasn't a list of different acts, of different bills. They came out of this. There were acts and bills. You know, it's because it, 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 I'll tell you one funny point on it, but it was a principle. Roosevelt, like Lincoln, 
acted on a fundamental principle of the founding of the American Republic. And this is American exceptionalism. This is why Lynn says it's got to come from the United States. Because the, Lincoln rested on the Declaration. All men are created equal, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It wasn't that he ignored the Constitution. He saw that as part of the Constitution. Relative to the issue of slavery, and for Lincoln, the issue of slavery was the issue of the equal right to the well-being of every member of the population. You know, some people get, was he, did he have a racist outlook on the relationship between the races? You know, I don't know. I doubt it in the way people think. But obviously, this was 150 years ago. And so the idea that the races could get along together and so forth was somewhat questionable at the time. Don't forget, we were just coming out of slavery. And a lot of Lincoln at one point said, I'm not sure why the slaves would want to live with us. You know, it wasn't just that he was saying, we're superior. He said, we haven't treated them all that well. OK? But Lincoln based himself on the principle, and he, he handled it that way. All men are created equal. All human beings are equal. He said, that's a principle embedded in the founding of the American Republic, and slavery stands against that principle. People have criticized sometimes the way he wanted to get rid of slavery, but his whole point was to get rid of it. Roosevelt stood on the preamble of the Constitution. Why? And look, this is what Lynn is saying. This is Lynn. Now, Lynn is a superior thinker to Roosevelt. He also has the advantage of having lived under Roosevelt, but there are other things, other grasp of 3,000 years of history. But don't underestimate that people like Roosevelt and Lincoln had a historical overview. They saw themselves as part of a great historic scheme. And so Roosevelt operated on this principle. Now, what, what, remember, what was the principle? What was it? You know, Lynn makes the point that seems a little funny that the issue of credit was the issue of the Constitution. And of course, historically, that's true. If you read the Federalist Papers, if you read the notes on the Constitutional Convention, I've read more of the Federalist Paper. What is Hamilton's argument? Hamilton writes two thirds of the Federalist Papers. What was his argument? We need a, a, a nation, a republic, a unified republic where the, cent the unified center is the principle that governs the states and all the different parts. Of course, what was happening? We were coming out of the Articles of Confederation, where the states were dominant, and the country was being torn apart by what? Free trade. Except now it was free trade where each state was sovereign. So indeed, they had better relationships to Great Britain than they did to each other. And that's not a joke. That's the reality of the situation. They had more tariffs and more separation and more charges for commerce across rivers and borders between the states than they did between the states and the British. They couldn't raise an army. They couldn't raise a navy. They couldn't issue currency. In fact, the Confederate Constitution was closer to the Articles of Confederation. So the, the whole point, the whole center of the debate over the Constitution was the control over the currency, the control over commerce, the control over the economy, the division of controls over taxes, and who had supremacy, and so on and so forth. It was all about who controlled the currency of the nation. Because that's the issue of the existence of the sovereign. No nation is sovereign that doesn't control its currency. You can, I don't care what else you have. You can have culture. You can have tradition. You can have an army. You can have all you want. If you don't control your currency, you've lost your sovereignty. Your fate is not in your hands. Now, uh, you know, this is, what, what, this is how we have to, this is the, the central conception in a whole tradition in the West. I don't know the, the other, but this goes to Plato, 
it goes to Solon, it goes to the whole Greek Renaissance and the conception of man. It goes to Aeschylus and Prometheus. Because the Greek Renaissance, whatever, rested on the idea, as expressed by Plato, that the unique quality of the human mind and the human individual is its ability to create and understand change in the universe such that human beings can control that change. You know, that's in a certain sense why he said you have to have philosophers, I, and he meant, remember what philosopher meant at that time. You could say that philosopher meant the same thing as naturalist meant in the 18th or 19th century. These were, in other words, these were the people who looked at, who were trying to, to, to find out what were the underlying principles of society and human relationship to nature. You know, in, in one sense, it's, I think there's a little bit of a, something you have to add when you say, well, uh, Plato's view, of, in particular, let's say, in the Parmenides, you get it in a, a longer versions in others of his dialogues, but it, you get it in a very interesting version in the Parmenides. And I'm, I'm going to tell you why I picked the Mar Parmenides for a second, in a second. But uh, it's a little unfair to Plato to quote the Heraclitus quote. Or I'd like to make a correction to it. Because, you know, Heraclitus, everything has changed. You never put your foot in the river, in the same river. It's a nice metaphor. But in a certain sense, in Plato, you, it, the, it's, it's not just that the, the water that you put your foot in changes. It's that the whole river changes. The whole flow changes. Indeed, for Plato, it's that we learn to control the flow of the water for our purposes, to accomplish our mission. Now, I think one of the interesting things, the reason I picked the Parmenides, because you know, Plato is at the forefront of scientific development. He does this in the Timaeus. He does it in the Theotetus, and so on and so forth. So uh, the reason I picked the Parmenides is because this begins to get at this issue of, uh, and, and I'll give you one other example of this, and then I'll kind of jump ahead. Because, um, is because if you look at the first half of the Parmenides, see, the way this is often taught is you had Plato, and then you had his student Aristotle. And he had these criticisms of Plato's epistemology, the theory of ideas. And in these criticisms, he takes you out of the ideal realm, this realm of you know, platonic ideas that are eternal and strange little, I think most people really do think of platonic ideas as these little models that are up in the basement, so in the attic somewhere. And you know, Courtney finds one, and he says, oh, here's a platonic idea or something like that. But um, you know, they're not up in heaven somewhere where there's some kind of paradigm and it kind of you kind of look at the things down here on earth and you see how much they're like the paradigm and so on and so forth. Now though most people say, well I, I don't have that idea of Plato. It, you'd be surprised how much it's embedded in the way we look at it. Okay? Because that is in Plato. For Plato, ideas are generative principles, which is why you have a, a an ordered realm of ideas in which the good is the idea out of which everything else comes. And the good, as we get it in the Parmenides, is a certain kind of real change, progressive, real development. Now, what, so what you get, what, the interesting thing to me is that Aristotle, there's a bunch of notes that students of Aristotle took, which are then given as Aristotle's criticisms of Plato. And you know how the how the forms could not be objects because then they couldn't be divided up amongst all the other different particular objects. And the most supposedly the most uh, devastating of the arguments is the so-called third man argument, where you know if you take if you say well the 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 object in this world participates 
in the Platonic idea, it has a certain likeness to it through which it participates, then what's the relationship of likeness? Because each object is like the idea in a different way. So what is it that's the likeness amongst the relationship to the Platonic ideas? That's a new idea. And each of the likenesses participate in that idea. And so we need a new relationship. And you can see where this goes. OK? Because now each of the likenesses participates in the idea of likeness in a different way. And so it's an infinite regress. Now, what's interesting about this is if you read the Parmenides, and it is obvious, and it shows you how much, if you read the Parmenides, the first half of the Parmenides, Plato goes through every one of these criticisms, Socrates and Plato. And he rejects every one of them as a concept of the Platonic ideas. And then the second half, this is what I think confuses people, he, he doesn't necessarily address it directly from the standpoint, so OK, what is a Platonic idea? What is it that isn't all these criticized models? And of course, you can't answer it that way. So what Plato does is he takes the Parmenidean idea of a one, which also is wrong, because it's a static one. It's an unchanging one. It's a single infinity that encompasses everything. And therefore, essentially, each step in the second half is the one is a night in which all cows are black. Everything dissolves into this infinite one. And so there's no change. There's no development. This is what being is. It's unchanging, undeveloping, et cetera. And so Plato ends it by saying, well, this couldn't be what being is. Nobody can participate in this idea. And nothing can exist. So what exists? And so Plato ends, as some people have famously said, on something of a joke. And he says, well, all things are and are not. All things are, exist and are coming into being, et cetera. All things are becoming. That is the nature of, that's the ontology of the universe. Now, the, the great question is, what can we understand what that becoming is? Can we know the principles that guide a process of becoming through a ongoing series of changes in our relationship to it? Because it's our, what really changes is our relationship to the underlying principles of change in the universe. In other words, in a sense, we have what we, I, I would call a second order relationship. We are developing. We change our relationship to the universe. Therefore, what do we find? We find the principles that govern development, which is reflected in our changing relationship to the universe. As we do that, since we have a changed relationship to the universe, there are elements of the universe that now appear to us that didn't exist in the prior relationship. But that's, an, a, a, that's an, a, a new level of the universe that comes as an ordered response to the existing changes that we made in our relationship. Now, since we can now take that new relationship and discover the principles that govern that relationship, we've now changed our relationship to the universe again. And by the powers it gives us, we open up to ourselves further elements of the universe. So now we have an ex a relationship of the changing knowledge of our relationship to the changing principles that come from our changing relationship to the universe. You know, and that's why to get to this, it's a little eerie. Because just when you think you should stop, you come to an end. 
you can't. Because at any point, the whole point is you've changed your knowledge of the universe, which gives you a new universe to deal with. And the real secret is that's the nature of the universe. The universe created a being that has that relationship to the universe. And that's the proof that what we do with the universe is the way the universe is. That's truth. Now, it doesn't mean you can just take any old change. You have to, you have to take the principle discovered and apply it to the universe. Does it open up new areas of the universe that give you greater power over the universe? That's the test. It's not a, an empirical verification, you know, can I make more money off of it or can I you know, hit somebody harder with it or whatever. It really depends upon, not, it depends upon does it give us a greater power to discover new things about the universe and in doing that give us a greater power over the universe, expand our knowledge and expand our capabilities. Look, this sounds, it's not abstract. Because ask yourself, for example, in, even in what the Greeks did, or let's say the pre-Greeks, okay, in the maritime societies, or what the Greeks do in measuring elements of the solar system, or in, in, in determining cycles in stellar observations or solar observations. You know, people get into the idea, well, it's cyclical, or this, and no, that's not what's going on. There's a principle of change in the universe and the interrelationship of cycles that tell us something about how we should act with respect to the universe. Therefore, we're discovering something about the universe, the existence of planets, the change in our relationship even to the fixed stars. This gives us a greater navigational ability, which means we can explore further parts of the planet. And we get a different idea about, the, about our relationship to the to the fixed stars and the, and the non-fixed stars. This gives us a greater ability to control our relationship to the universe. We develop calendars. We develop long-term calendars. We develop some knowledge about how uh, life existed on the planet. We develop optical capabilities. Some of this is just measurements. We build things to allow us to carry out agriculture, other for, which is the basis for some levels of trade. We also develop other technologies. We develop metallurgical knowledge. But what do we do when we do this? We're now creating a new relationship to the mineral content of the planet. We begin to discover things about how those minerals came to be where they are, how to work on them, which means we begin the long process of the development of chemistry, of our knowledge of the elements. Now we're looking at atomic phenomena, subatomic phenomena. Look at the development of optical laws, which become the basis for the microscope and the telescope. So now we're seeing parts of the world we never saw before. You know, it's a funny thing in the 17th century, with the advent of microscopes, you, you know, the th people know, tend to know a little bit more about the telescope, uh, you know, the sunspots, et cetera, et cetera. But you had the development of the microscope, <laughs> you have to realize the discovery, let's say in a bowl of water, of all of the living debris in that water, bacteria, you know, single cell uh, creatures. This was all discovered for the first time really, to my knowledge, at least discovered in the Western world in the 17th century. People like Swarmerdam and Leeuwenhoek and so on and so forth. And there may have been others that, that I, right? So this is partly the basis for what Leibniz says, that there are worlds within worlds. That there's always more as you, we just have the ability to look deeper and deeper and further and further out. And of course, this is, where, this is how Riemann, what, what is Riemann says, that when you go further and further out and deeper and deeper in, the existing laws of geometry won't work. 
You're going to have to learn the laws of physics because our own relationship to it has changed. So all this stuff that's supposedly 20th century existential uncertainty, these guys knew all this. They weren't operating on some idiot basis that we're going to see the last little particle. And since we can't see the last little particle without disturbing it, now we've, uh, we've confirmed the existential nature of the universe. That's the way knowledge has always developed. We always change our relationship to what we're observing. There's really nothing new in the uncertainty principle. All they're saying is, well, we got a final point of this kind of observation, which is the point that Einstein makes. He says, that's all you've done. This form of observation has reached its, uh, a certain limit. We've got to figure out other ways to comprehend what's going on beneath that limit. The same thing holds for interstellar space. Now, in one sense, the reason to, 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 to get at some of this is what is the enemy of this kind what, what is one way to be the enemy of this kind of thinking now I'm not going to one, one, one thing that's kind of funny what is, what, what, do, what does Euclid do what is Aristotle but let's take Euclid we know Euclid is, is a roughly around 300 BC now what do we know most of Greek geometry and most of what you could call a kind of Greek physics, which is related to the geometric work, because a lot of what they did in geometry was actually mechanics. Like if you take Menechmus's building of the doubling of the curve, he creates a mechanical device, which in its motion traces out the curve that gives you the doubling of the cube. It's a little different than what Archytas does. But Archytas is dealing with a similar kind of problem. He's looking at a series of constructions and what's the rate at which those constructions change with respect to each other? So he's looking for a mean, two means between two extremes. But he's, built, he's actually building a device that he knows measures out that proportion. Menechmus does something with a little bit different with a mechanical device. Okay? They do a lot of work which is not unlike what's done with involutes and evolutes. With moving, you, know, you take a, a flat line and move it along a curve. And what's the curve traced out by the end of that line? So they developed a whole knowledge of different kinds of curves, which you saw with Kepler. Conchoids, they were working on elliptic, ellipses, uh, lemnus gates, and they did all this by construction, by physical construction. And this is all done in the 5th century, the 6th century, the 4th century BC. This is a tradition that Plato and Archytas come out of, people like Hipparchus and uh, others before then. Oh, this is what Thales does. Remember, what, what is Thales is working essentially on the development of the idea of similar triangles in uh, uh, astronomical observations. Now, what happens with Euclid? Euclid takes all of this and supposedly systematizes it. And what does he do? He takes a set of axioms which these guys did not believe in. They did not have this axiomatic outlook. And there's one interesting example, I think, that looked at a little bit differently. They didn't have this stuff. They didn't think that cur straight lines were superior to curves. They operated on a constructive basis. If you look at Archytas' construction, there's nothing in it that says, start with a straight line. <coughs> And let's try to approximate. I mean, this is a problem you get with Archimedes, though he does good work, or you get it with Eudoxus. These may be interesting characters, but they're the ones that introduce this method of exhaustion. OK? So you know, Euclid comes 200 years later in some cases. And he says, no, there's a set of axioms and what we can deduce from those axioms. Now, I'm going to short circuit this a little bit, but what, what is, what is, what's the point here? Well, one point is, as with Aristotle, the only way to get, what's the standard of truth? The standard of truth is fixity. We want a fixed, essentially perfect system. 
a set of axioms that we know are true and are inviolable, and a set of rules for deducing theorems from those axioms. Now, keep in mind, basically, if you have a set of formal logical rules, now, the funny thing is Aristotle's logic was, didn't work all that well. He had a lot of logical truths that weren't logically true. And people are going through this. But if you, let's, for the moment, take the deductive methods of Euclid. Every theorem in Euclid's axiomatic system is a tautology. It's simply a manipulation of the existing truths in the axioms and the postulates and the definitions. There's, you can get nothing new out of an axiomatic formal system. Everything is in the system by definition, if it's going to stick within its own rules of deduction and its own definitions and its own axioms. Therefore, implicitly, the entire system is fixed, unless there's a paradox or an anomaly. But of course, if there's a paradox or an anomaly, the question is, is the system all wrong? And if so, what do we, what do we replace it with? Now, taken by itself, I w one of these days I'll go through this argument in a longer way, but taken by itself, if we have an axiomatic formal deductive system, and I mean, by, by the simplest idea of a formal deductive system is take the one simple law, which in modern logic, <laughs> there's some argument you can do all of logic with, ju with just this and maybe a couple other things, but it's the idea if you have a sentence, if P then Q, and then P, you can conclude Q. OK? That's a, that's a formal proof. That's, a, that's a, a, a deductive rule in logic. OK? Um, if the sun shines, I will go to the store. This sentence is true. When, if the sun shines, I go to the store. <laughs> now, that may not seem too brilliant, but that's logic for you, you know? Um, and so, what do you have? You have an axiom, and you have essentially certain rules for rearranging the axiom in conjunction with certain other axioms and definitions and so forth. Now, the interesting thing to me is, if the standard of truth, I think uh, you'll see why I'm making a bit of a point about it. If the standard of truth is the only thing we can know to be true and can stand on for certain, is certainty, is an unchanging fixed truth, then recognize that if, if, you have that, if that's the standard and the only thing that meets that standard is an axiomatic deductive system, then I would argue that, in effect, there is no such thing as time. This is the bad case of the simultaneity of eternity. OK? Everything is simply there. It's all in the axioms and definitions. You just haven't gone through the proofs. But they're all there. They're all implicitly there in the rules of deduction and the axioms. And human beings may suffer the indignity of having to go through unfolding it. And you can say that that unfolding occurs in time. It's a, it may be a discovery to the human mind, but it's all there irregardless of the human mind. It's all already there once you have the axioms. And there's, there's nothing. Time is an illusion. It's just the time it takes us to figure out what, everything that's been there. In effect, the, if you apply this to physics, then the whole universe is predetermined. And freedom of, free will is an illusion. Now, here's where you get into an interesting uh, kind of problem. Well, don't we believe in causality? And isn't causality a certain kind of determinism? Well, 
yes, we believe in causality, but part of causality is the causal efficacy of human choice, of human freedom. But what's real human freedom? Human freedom is changing our relationship to the universe as a whole. That's where human freedom resides, in the discovery of principles that open up new areas of the universe so that we can act on it and, in a certain sense, bring changes into the universe that the universe couldn't bring into itself, or at least reach that point. But the universe of a formal axiomatic system of Euclid, of Aristotle, is a dead universe. Just like any perfect universe is a dead universe. This is why Lynn repeats Philo's argument against the Aristotelians. If the universe, if God is perfect in the sense of unchanging, and if in the creation of the universe he's created something that he couldn't change, then God is impotent. God is dead. But that's not the universe that God created because God created human beings who are, who, for the purpose of replicating his own creative actions his, uh, in the universe. Now, every time I've seen in the history of the human species, you have an experience of development, of a renaissance where this becomes the standard. This issue has been used, this idea that you need a a, a, a standard of perfect, 100% fixed certainty, and that's truth. Because in fact, indeed, in the real universe, we're talking about an anti-entropic universe, a universe of constant progressive development, demonstrable by our existence. Therefore, the universe is never complete. It's never perfected. It's in the, process, the perfection of the universe, of the creator of human existence in the universe, is precisely, our, that's what's perfect about the universe. That we can always change our relationship and go deeper into the underlying principles of the universe as they evolve with respect to our relationship to it. So there's no such thing as, this is why Lynn, I think, has made a point, I don't, I don't know, if it's, uh, that completion is a very bad idea. The idea that I want the complete story on this, every detail. I want you to show to me a deductive proof of everything that you're saying. The only reason people challenge us that way is because we're not the power. See, they never ask that of the people in power. <laughs> Those who control the system enforce the system, you got to believe. But whenever you want to change the system, they say, well, wait a minute, how do I know that's true? <laughs> and then every time you show them that it's true, they say, oh, well, I'm still not sure. That's not a perfect deductive truth. <laughs> now, you know, it, it, this has evolved somewhat. But the, the evolution of it was, and I'm going to get to the point about Hilbert in a second. Well, uh, the, the, the evolution of it is that, indeed, with the Renaissance, and remember, we had this big hiatus, what, 16, 17, 1800 years, between uh, Archimedes and uh, Eratosthenes and Cusa um, and whatnot. But what happens? You have an explosion of human development after Kuza. And I mean, this is massive. By the way, it is the case, if you want an example of an accelerating, as I said, if you look at human development, even with all the problems, it's, a, it's at least in potential an accelerating rate of development, an accelerating rate of acceleration. In other words, we're, we're growing faster, let's say, since the Renaissance than we were at any time before, even including the Greek period. Because the development of certain kinds of power over resources exploded at this point. And it was over a larger population scale and so on and so forth. So this is the kind of thing that we had. So what happens? The oligarchy is faced with the problem. 
somewhat the cat is out of the bag. There's a rate of undeniable development that already in the Renaissance creates the first examples of nation states or citizens, which becomes a force that the oligarchy cannot simply control. So on the one hand, they need some of the advanced scientific and technological development, or they need to at least match it at some level. On the other hand, they don't want this to be done in such a fashion that increases the spread of the sense of the value of the individual citizen and the capabilities of the individual citizen to develop their powers. So we need a, a, a means of incorporating some of the scientific advances so that we can at least keep pace technologically and at the same time suppress the idea that this is something, creativity is a, see now they're not trying to suppress certain people. They're trying to change the idea of creativity. They're trying to destroy and suppress explicitly the idea of creativity. So that scientific progress becomes in effect a random event. It's just okay, we're out there, we're human beings, we have a lot of funny characteristics, we have a lot of experiences, and we have this way of toting up the experiences and trying to put new labels on it, and sometimes the labels happen to strike a good idea. And then we want to use it. But don't get the illusion. See, here's where it's a fight over the mind. It's not just suppressing people. Don't have the illusion that there's an actual creative power in the human mind that coheres with, that is attuned to, the actual laws of the universe. And it is not contained within any formal system. It breaks the rules. I mean, what happens, by the way, in Euclidean geometry? It, there's an interesting problem that does come up. And I think it's often portrayed the wrong way. OK? It, it, there's, there's an inhering little flaw in their own principle, which exists in the, in the parallel postulate. But not because there's, there's some strange, just odd thing about the parallel postulate. It's because of the formulation of it. How do, they, how do they look at it? Remember, Euclid's view and Aristotle's view is everything was based on experience. The, de the demonstration of self-evidence was isn't it self-evident that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And a straight line has this following character, you know, 180 degrees, we, et cetera, et cetera. Isn't it the case that a line is made of points because it's infinitely divisible? These are essentially argued for by experience. Now, however, in all these proofs, many of them, like the 180 degrees in a, in a triangle, depend on the parallel postulate. Now, what does the parallel postulate say? The parallel postulate says, given a line and a point, not on that line, there's one and only one parallel line through that point. Now, how do you define parallel? No matter how far it's extended, it won't meet. Now, where do you get that in experience? What in your experience includes the infinite? So this is not a contradiction in the idea of the infinite. It's an anomaly in the Euclidean idea of the basis for the self-evidence of the, of the axioms, of the postulates. So are they or are they not based on experience? And of course, indeed, there's nothing in experience that tells you this. We don't know what happens if you extend the line ad infinitum. In fact, everything tells us that since the universe has certain principles that bound it, that contain the universe, it's probably the case that a line extended forever will not go on forever. Did you come up with that contradiction? Did I? Uh, I I'm sure I'm not. Somebody else. No, I, I, yeah, I've seen similar kinds of points. You have to decipher it from the way in which people argue this point. I mean, I indeed, everyone had the question, how do we, in effect, know that this is self-evident? It does revolve around the issue of self-evidence. Because anything that brings up the, the infinite is going to raise questions about self-evidence. There's nothing self-evident about the infinite. And indeed, there's a real question as to whether the, the idea of the infinite is a word, uh, an idea. I would, for example, argue that 
contour when he talks about the infinite isn't really talking about what most people thought, think of the infinite. He's thinking of what he calls a transfinite, and there's a lot of confusion later on. But in his better point, the tra transfinite does mean finite but unbounded. That's almost the literal translation of the word. And what he means by uh, uh, infinite is really incommensurable. What he says is, if you have something that's uncountable, then that's a different quality of number. And then if you, the question is, can you match up the countability of different unities, different wholes? So the real numbers are all taken as a whole, and the counting numbers taken as a whole have a different countability. They can't be, they're incommensurable. It's much more like the incommensurable. And he says this himself in the Grunlagen. What he's looking at in the transfinite is a different commensurability, not a different size. Not one is a little bit further out there. OK? Now, the same thing in effect. And so what Sarpy does is he says, look, everything comes from experience. And all laws are simply categorical names that we place on these experiences. We sort of package them under one name or under one principle. And that's Occam. It's called nominalism. Occam explicitly argues that there is no such thing as a universal concept, a universal principle. There are only names, labels, that we put on categories of events. And we choose to categorize them a certain way as we please. It's completely arbitrary. And there's no real connection between what, we, uh, what, we say, what our principles are and reality. I mean, one thing to be said about this view of the world is it's implicitly schizoid. I mean, you're living in a world where there's no connection between the mind and the world that you live in. It seems to be an arbitrary something or other generating device. And you get this in the 20th century in Chomsky. This is Chomsky's view of the so-called Cartesian linguistics. The mind is an infinite grammar generating device. It's a computer, basically. It's an operating, basically, you know, essentially you're born with an operating system and the culture applies applications to the operating system and they call that language. You have a grammar generating device, and you know you, you 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 grow up in a culture which gives certain words are associated with certain objects and it gives it meaning, and then the you you know that 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 becomes your applications, and you know you run it through this thing and you get some language out of it. Okay, that's Chomsky. He may say it's something else, but that's what it is. And you get something similar in in, in European linguistics structuralism and so on and so forth. A lot of, a lot of uh, anthropology is based on this. There are certain built-in structures in a culture. Now, some people say they're, they're built-in, they're sort of instinctive, there's an underlying matrix. Some say it's you know, learned, but it's all structured. Now, what you get, what, uh, what I think uh, you know, uh, I'm looking at and other people are looking at, is when you get to, what, what do you have? with the period, let's say, from Leibniz in particular, and all the back and forth that Lynn is going through, I'm not going to go through. But basically, you do get from Leibniz to Kessner to Gauss, you get the, a tremendously powerful development of science, or at least potentially. And there are other areas that are part of this, chemistry, physical chemistry, you know, uh, the whole. Think of the fact that up until the 19th century, we had no idea about elements, about chemical actions based on the molecular and atomic level. We didn't know there were 92 elements. We didn't know how they were ordered. We, be, we didn't know what oxygen was or that oxygen was essential to combustion. A whole array of this thing were not known until the 18th and into the 19th century. That wasn't that long ago. We're talking, you know, 200 years. 
So there was, you, you have the whole control over elements of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the developments under, uh, you know, Weber, Gauss, and really, by the time you get to Riemann, there's a, a, a and, and Weber, there's a push, and, you know, Larry has this in this thing that he put out, and there's other, I mean, Lynn has certainly pointed to this. There's really a sense that you could develop a unified theory of the lawfulness of the universe. And you're already getting some of this by the mid to late 19th century in people like uh, uh, Vernadsky, uh, but also some others in a much less developed way that Vernadsky himself points to. People who are doing studies of geology, some people in the United States. They, they are looking at the solar system, they're looking at elements as part of a living development. And of course, you know, Vernadsky even points to some people who are looking at, you can say, something that, that at least provokes in him the idea of the, no, of the noosphere. Cephalization and so on and so forth. This exists. Now, it exists in Vernadsky and, and Riemann and, and to a certain degree in Einstein in, in, a, in a different way. Think about, the, we have to look at in what sense is Einstein's view anti-entropic. Now, the main thing I think as a starting point is his insistence that there's a unified conception underlying electromagnetic, gravitational, electrodynamic phenomena. Because that brings you to the step of how are these organized, thanks, how are these organized to exist in a universe in which there's life, in, or in a universe in which there's constant development and change, even in the physics of the universe. Or his understanding of Kepler. Now what happens? Because Riemann has this explicitly. Riemann's looking at, from, from all the work that, he's, that Lynn is looking at, and remember, what has Lynn pointed us to? The fragments, the work on electromagnetism, the habilitation paper. Now, you take these things together, and Riemann is conceptualizing at least the universe from the infinitely small to the infinitely large, at least relative to what we have, as a single unified conception. But, we're, but we have to look at the fact that there's an underlying unity, even though his whole point is the existing laws of geometry don't apply to either end. That we have to get at the physics, or what he calls the colligating principles, that unify these conceptions. Including, if you look at the fragments, including the way in which certain things work in the noetic. How, do, how does something that's not physical change something that's physical? How does an idea, and this is what Lynn is, you know, the, the, has referred to as Geistesmassen and so forth, how does an idea have an actual physical force? How does it change our relationship to the universe? How does it move things through principles? Now, um, at this point, you have an attack, it's going on the whole, but a full-scale attack on this outlook. And I'll tell you, what's interesting to me is what's the attack that sort of sticks? And, you know, you have an attack on anybody who represents this. You know, uh, Contour probably wasn't really in this tradition. He was, he had some ideas. His problem was he really was controlled by the people who were against Riemann. So he had he doesn't have that much to say about Riemann. He, he mentions him in passing. But what, what's, the, what's the attack? The attack comes from the idea of 100% certainty, that the standard of truth is logical truth, logical proof. Though they didn't even have this, the, the, they're talking, you're talking about the, let's say, 1860, 1870, 1850. You don't have formal systems the same way we do now. Really, formal logical systems only come into existence from about the mid-19th century on. I mean, you had, you had people like Leibniz trying things, but it wasn't a formal logical system. He saw it as encoding certain kinds of knowledge, which was inferior to the art of invention. 
of creativity. But these guys say it's not true until you have it formally proven. Now, the example is Weierstrass, who introduces a principle of perfect deductible proof. And what he charges Riemann is a failure to prove the existence of certain mathematical ideas. In other words, uh, take the case of um, a minimum. What, what, what Weierstrass essentially argues is, in every case, you have to not only show that the, what the minimum would be like if it existed, you have to prove that the minimum exists. And he gives certain examples, like if you have an asymptote. In, you know, in some sense, an asymptote, the minimum might not exist. You never quite get to the bottom. You get closer and closer and closer, but you never get there. So what if, 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 if Riemann's talking about a case like that, he hasn't proven, therefore, that the minimum exists in every case. That's the Dirichlet principle. And Riemann's approach to this idea of transcendentals is that the transcendental represents a branch point into a new surface. So these points of branching, poles, or minimums, may, uh, Weierstrass argues, you can't know if you have the transition unless you can prove it exists. So everything has to be reordered into mathematically formal proofs. Now, in, most, in almost every case, it's proven that Riemann's right. And in, certainly in physics, there really is no such thing as an asymptote. You either get, something happens. You got to figure out what's happening. Just like they had to figure out black holes were mathematical points of infinity. But black holes are not points of infinity. Black holes are physical phenomena that we have to understand, and they're not black holes. You know, now we've got all the exceptions to the black holes. They have radiation leaking out of them, and so on and so forth. OK? Now, the person, it, 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 Lynn raises the case of Hilbert, because it, like a lot of these guys, they're not uninteresting people. Hilbert was not a dummy. And that's part of the problem in many respects. Because Hilbert was not a wild-eyed positivist like Russell. I mean, the logical positivists are insane. I mean, Russell wouldn't call himself a logical positivist, but he was the granddaddy of logical positivism. I mean, the logical positivists believe that there's experiences which you put labels on called names. OK? And then there's uh, a logical system from which you deduce certain truths. And that's science. And the, 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 the extent to which they go is anything that discusses things that you cannot express as an experience that you put a label on and deduce something from that is meaningless. That's the, that's the Differentia specifica of logical positivism. If, it, if you can't express it as a set of experiences, I saw the billiard ball hit the billiard ball 700 times, and then I made the, I put the name, I put this label sentence on it, and I've deduced these truths from it. If you can't do that, if you say something like, um, the mind of man, uh, it, it, discovered this, they say, well, the idea of a mind is meaningless. I'm not kidding. All these things are meta, anything that's metaphysical has no meaning. It's a nonsense word. Now, Russell is essentially in that direction. But of course, Russell is the guy who gave you Principia Mathematica, which is the logical format for the positivists. This is what they, this is their system. Okay? Now, the, the positivist before this, Hilbert, in a sense, is a positivist. Mach, their problem is while they admit experience and even to a certain extent the creative juices of human beings, and they don't call it meaningless, what they do do is they hold to the standard that real scientific truth must be deductive truths. You can have a little bit of experience thrown in. But it's it, the only rigorous truth, the only standard of truth. Everything else is just 
mixed up with guesswork. It could be insightful. But so what happens when this is your standard of truth? Now, we have to say one of two things. Either the human mind is held to that standard, which means you've ruled out actual creativity as a truth-seeking phenomenon of the human mind, or you've got to argue for schizophrenia. There's, you know, there's some unre unreal part of the human mind that happens to accidentally generate truths, and we test it this way. But it has no real connection to what goes It's somehow outside the universe. Now, I'll give you an example. Just, this is what, what Lynn. Now, I'll give you two examples. Because in 1900, and then I'll end it. In 1900, actually, he does this through his whole life. He has a, in 1900, Hilbert makes a speech where he outlines 23 problems for mathematics to be solved in the 20th century. Now, some of these are technical, maybe even interesting. I mean, I'll give you an example for those of you. Problems of prime numbers. He talks about the Riemann prime number, solving that. Is, you know, can we prove Riemann's hypothesis on the, the density of prime numbers? And Riemann has a function which he says gives you a density. It doesn't tell you where they're going to be, but it tells you what the density is going to be at any, as far out as you go. Um, the irrationality and transcendence of certain numbers. He's looking at the issue of transcendental numbers. Quadratic forms with any algebraic numerical coefficient. But in the beginning, and in many of these, he does respect Riemann. He, he's looking at problems generated by Riemann or solutions that Riemann came up with, and are they valid? But he, in his first handful are what he calls foundational, foundations of geometry. The first one is contours continuum problem. Now, number two and number six are the ones that are relevant. But number two, the, the ca compatibility of arithmetical axioms. When we are investigating, in, when we are engaged in investigating the foundations of a science, we must set up a system of axioms which contain an exact and complete description of the relations subsisting between the elementary ideas of that science. So his idea is basically you can have a complete set of axioms. The axioms so set up are at the same time the definitions of those elementary ideas. And no statement within the realm of the science whose foundation we are testing is held to be correct unless it can be derived from those axioms by means of a finite number of logical steps. So I'm not even sure what he would say about certain uh, infinite series solutions to calculus problems. But anyway, um, uh, upon closer consideration, the question arises whether in any way certain statements of single axioms depend upon one another, and whether the axioms may not therefore contain certain parts in common, which must be isolated if one wishes to arrive at a system of axioms that shall be altogether independent of one another. That is, you want to reduce it to the minimum number of axioms that you need. You don't want any axioms that repeat things. So they all have to be independent. They're not proven from each other. They're independent fundamental axioms. Um, and then he says the issue is to prove that they're compatible, that they're, in, that they're consistent. And the question is, can you pr prove that the system is consistent from within itself? by its own laws. If, a contra if contradictory attributes be assigned to a concept, I say that mathematically, the concept doesn't exist. Now, that, here, listen to what he has to say. There, it doesn't mean that it's not something. He says, so for example, a real number whose square is minus 1 does not exist mathematically. But if it can be proved that the attributes assigned to the concept can never lead to a contradiction by the application of a finite number of logical processes, I say that the mathematical existence of the concept is thereby proved. So in other words, he, his idea is the square root of minus 1 is not related to any physical process. If it leads to a contradiction, it's not mathematical. If it does not lead to a contradiction, you can use it as a symbol in the mathematical language. And so Hilbert is led in the direction of treating 
all certain truths, all standards of truth, as effectively logical formalisms, and their, their reality as, as a mathematical idea is restricted to its logical consistency. Okay? Now, he then goes on to talk about, he says in a little bit looser way, the proof of the compatibility of the axioms is at the same time the proof of the mathematical existence of the complete system of real numbers or the continuum. In other words, he's also arguing for completeness. Now later on, he makes this part of his so-called Hilbert program. That the idea is he wants to prove that a mathematically consistent and complete a formalization, an axiomatic formalization of mathematics is possible that's both consistent and complete. And that's his standard of truth. Now again, these guys are different than the logical, but he doesn't say every discussion is nonsense. He doesn't say you can't talk about these other things. He respects the idea that somebody like Riemann is a great intuitive mathematician. And it's funny, if you look at this book by Hadamard, that some people have read here, if you look at it like uh, toward the end of the book, he takes as two examples, he takes as his two examples one of the rigorous formalistic mathematician who might be somewhat creative and the extremely intuitive mathematician. He, the examples he takes are Weierstrass and Riemann, okay, as great examples of these traditions in German mathematics and so forth. Now, and in a sense, if that doesn't close the, 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 the deal for you. Um, then you go to problem six, which in a sense, I think you have to look at two and six together. I don't know if Lynn would think that. Because in six, which is the problem that Lynn refers to with respect to Hilbert, he says, but then if you reflect back now, reflect on what he means by a mathematical truth. And then he says, Six, mathematical treatment of the axioms of physics. And this is somewhat unique. If you look at all the other 22 problems are mathematical problems. I mean, at least you can talk about them in mathematical terms. This is not that. He says, the investigations on the foundations of geometry suggest the problem to treat in the same manner by means of axioms those physical sciences in which mathematics plays an important part. In the first rank are the theory of probabilities and mechanics. As to the axioms of the theories of probabilities, it seems to me desirable that their logical investigation should be accompanied by a rigorous and satisfactory development of the method of mean values in mathematical physics, and in particular in kinetic theory of gases. Important investigations by physicists on the foundations of mathematics are at hand. I refer to the writings of Mach, Hertz, Boltzmann, and Folkmann. Um, it is therefore very desirable that the discussion of the foundations of math mechanics be taken up by mathematicians also. And this is the Mach positivist program. In other words, everything is mechanics. Everything is the experience and then me mechanical and kinetic theories. And so what you get is effectively the model of physics is kinetic gas theory or, um, or thermodynamics. And what are they? They're probabilistic or kinetic. And the idea is you apply differential equations to these circumstances. You take initial conditions, you set up the formula, and you, you, know, you apply uh, differential equations to it. In other words, you take infinitely small changes, and you try to generalize this. So this is Hilbert's program. Because remember, you've got to take the two together. Six says, let's do with physics, model on kinetic gas theory and mechanics, what we did with mathematics and geometry. What's mathematics? Mathematics is a formal deductive system. It's basically the manipulation of symbols. He says this later on. Now, there's a lot of, and he gets into a lot of controversies, and generally he's not, but he represents this particular kind of weakness. That the idea is, and he says explicitly at a certain point, you know, yes, there's creativity. Let me see if I can find it. Hmm. 
No, sorry. Well, this come to close. Um, I thought I had it. It remains to discuss briefly what general requirements may be justly la laid down for the solution of a ma mathematical problem. I should say, first of all, this, that it shall be possible to establish the correctness of the solution by means of a finite number of steps based upon a finite number of hypotheses which are implied in the statement of the problem and which always, must always be exactly formulated. This requirement of logical deduction by means of a finite number of processes is simply the requirement of rigor in reasoning. Indeed, the requirement of rigor, which has become proverbial in mathematics, corresponds to a universal philosophical necessity of our understanding. On the other hand, only by satisfying this requirement do the thought content and the suggestiveness of the problem attain their full effect. Now, I think that. Okay. Yeah, he said, but in further development of a branch of mathematics, the human mind, encouraged by the success of its solutions, becomes conscious of its independence. It evolves from itself alone, often without appreciable influence from without, by means of logical combination, generalization, specialization, by separating and collecting ideas in fortunate ways, and so on. But basically, he's saying, until you've got it into a formal system, you don't know whether it, it doesn't have the standard of truth. So what the mind does is not a standard of truth. Creative discovery is not a standard. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be rigorous. This is not. I mean, they have a certain definition of rigor. Our definition of rigor is more rigorous because it applies to the actual universe and to our actual relationship to it. It's a standard of development of the human mind and its relationship to the universe. But what this amounts to, actually, I think you can think of it as very similar in certain respects to what Sarpy with Occam did to the Renaissance. They're looking at the actual discoveries of these guys, including Riemann, including Gauss. And they're basically saying, we, we have to apply a standard of formal deductive reason and empiricism so that, in effect, we can incorporate what they have discovered, but reject the process of creative development by which they made the discovery. So we can't reproduce their mind. And indeed, this in some ways is precisely the project that Lynn laid out in the Gauss project and the series project. The real issue is not to, go, is not to simply replicate every proof that Gauss went through or Riemann goes through, but to reproduce the mind that set itself these problems and treated them as one problem for their entire life. So, all right. That's, that, I think I'll leave it at that. Any, why don't we have to see if there's any questions? You can ask questions about other topics if you want. Or make statements. Huh? Along the lines of what you just said, uh -huh. translating the Bernadsky correspondence to the mathematician, uh, I sent you this. Yeah, Luzin, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, Luzin, he quotes uh, Lebesque. He says he met with him in France, in Paris in 1930, and that Lebesque was very upset about Hilbert's complete system he was trying to create. Mm -hmm. and, and he described it as a Tower of Babel that was going to collapse. And then essentially said it did collapse in a few years. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything more about him or these opposition circles? Lebec program. Lebec, I don't know uh, about. Um, um, what I do know is, I, I think part of what he's referring to is, of course, Gödel in 1928. Um, or 25 or 28, Hilbert still puts forward uh, these three challenges. One is the consistency 
of formal arithmetic of the Principia, the completeness of it, and then what he called, what's called, and this becomes a big deal in computer theory, uh, the, the Entscheidung's problem, the decision problem. That is, if you're doing, if you're using a computing device, can you prove that the computing device will or will not be able to solve the problem? In other words, do you know when to stop? In effect, okay. If you're going so far, you know, you can. You, can you come up with a decision pro procedure for every calculation? And indeed, it turns out all three things don't don't work. Okay, uh, completeness and consistency don't work together, and you can't. A, a computing device, at least a binary system, cannot decide for every question whether there will be or will not be a solution. Okay, so this is like 28, I think it is. Now, Gödel's proof does, despite what's said by some people, does end the Hilbert project. In other words, what Gödel proves is even for a simple effort to capture arithmetic, you cannot produce a complete system. There are always truths that are, you can demonstrate our arithmetic truths that are not provable within the formal system. And no matter how you add to the, in other words, if you add, some clever guy might say, well, okay, let me add that truth as an axiom. Well, it turns out once you add the axiom, there are new truths that are generated. So the whole project goes down the tubes. Now, I think there were other schools of people who were uh, oppositionists, but not all of them were the greatest. For example, you had the intuitionists, which I never totally understood, but because they have such a restriction on things, I'm not sure you can do anything. You know, their idea is you can only, <clears throat> there, if you have a proof, nothing in that proof can make any assumption about uh, unconstructable, unknowable thing, un, not unknowable, unconstructable or infinite processes. So for example, they reject any idea of a proof by reductio ad absurdum. Now there's something a little bit in that, but they, they, they just destroy virtually any proof at all. Because their argument is, if you, if you prove that if you, let's say you want to prove theorem A, and then you prove that theorem not A leads to a contradiction. In most systems, then you can say, well, then A is true, because if not A is not true, then A is true. Okay. Now they say no, because maybe there's something else. You haven't proven A. You've only proven not not A. And they don't, for them, a double negative. So there's opposition to Hilbert from all kinds of flanks. But I think there was serious opposition, um, you know, from Gödel from all the people who rejected positivism. I mean, I think if you look at it more deeply, you'd find that people like uh, Planck and Einstein might have had respect for Hilbert, but did not agree with his, his outlook on the development of science. I don't know these are fr French circles. Um, but I know Lebec is famous for the Lebec integral, but that's all I can tell you. Um, uh, I, but I, there, there are all kinds of oppositionists. But the big crack in this was Gödel. And this led to a tremendous scrambling by these people. You know, one, one legend is that after Gödel's proof, von Neumann uh, never dealt with logic again. Now, that, that I think is not true, but uh, they say he was freaked out by it at any rate. Because it seems like some people kept going. I read this oh, paper by uh, Paul Bernays. Hilbert's student, and he's writing in 1931, and he's referring to yeah. Gödel's paper, but he's just, they're continuing to try. To well, there were two two schools of thought on this, I think, and actually, I think there's one that became very prominent, which which was a, a little more clever. One school just tried to get around it, like you often get. You know, well, you can add axioms, you can create stratified formal theories, you know, where you just put, you add axioms in and you put 
rules that say one level of the theory doesn't. They had something called um, ramified types. So you, what you did was you structured the formal system so that at every level you had kind of a firewall that one level couldn't apply to the other level. Okay, and in some ways you could create a more completed system that way. So they had all kinds of things, but the um, the one that I think really affected people is if you look at uh, uh, people like um, well you, names wouldn't you might know some of the names I mean Bernays but people like uh, Tarski, Alonzo Church, uh, Turing, all these guys who were famous in the computer world, okay. Um, uh, I mean, I would say even people like, you know, uh, well, von Nor I mean, basically von Neumann and, and Wiener hold this outlook. Their basic view is, okay, I mean, and, and you have to follow this. I always find this striking, but a lot of people don't find this striking. But the, their argument becomes the following. They simply invert the argument. They say, okay, you can't have a complete, consistent, formal system. But our standard of truth is formal truth. Therefore, whatever the human mind does that's outside of that standard doesn't count as knowledge or truth. The human mind can only carry out computations which are coherent with computable devices, computable solutions. Uh, it, it, we can only decide on the same kind of problem a computer can decide on. So if you take the entire set of decidable questions in mathematics or in computation, that's the entire set of what the human mind can decide upon. In other words, we're limited, so all we've proven is our own limits. Since a logical formal system has this limit, therefore the human mind has that limit with respect to discovering the truth. So they just invert it. They sort of turn it on its head. And one way that they do it is they take, they do something of the following nature. And I don't know all these different functions, but I know what they've done. You have something called Markov algorithm, which is a, a certain way of carrying out computations. You have something called lambda functions, which is a certain kind of recursive computational function. Then you have another uh, group of and these are all things that are computable and decidable. In other words, if you use these algorithms, you will come to a computable conclusion. Now what they prove is all these are equivalent. They all converge. They all have, they're all essentially the same function. They all give you the same computable set of solutions. Okay. Now since all of the mechanical devices, all of the computer devices, all of the binary devices, all of the algorithms, all the recursive functions, all give you the same set of decidable questions, then that proves that that's all that's decidable. Therefore, the human mind is limited to that same decision process. So that's how they make the artificial intelligence argument. It's somewhat the same thing that they do with all these experiments. Like the, the, uh, there's one guy. Uh, he, he has this thing, if you're sitting behind a screen and you, you carry out a conversation with what's on the other side of the screen and you can't tell the difference between that and a human being, then that proves that there's no, there is no difference. Okay? So they go through all these machinations to try to show that the human mind is limited to digital devices. And I think that's the main, that's the main uh, stream of response to Gödel. You haven't really proven anything except the limitation of what we can know to be true. Because the standard of truth is computable truths. And since all mathematically computable, solvable uh, solutions to mathematical questions are this set, and we know we can we can decide on those. There may be others we can't decide on. 
But those are, you know, if the human mind chooses to decide on them, that's arbitrary. That's not knowledge. Even if it's true. Because it's just a lucky guess. And I think that's where the whole, that's where you find the hegemony of information theory. All you have is the signal. That's all you can deal with. Now, there's a lot more to, I mean, I think if you look at, um, if you look at uh, Einstein and Planck on the question of human freedom, there's, there's a strength and there's a weakness. You know, they don't really, I think Einstein comes a little closer. They don't really go to this issue of, is there a causality which is not completely deterministic? You know, if you look at Planck, he tries to get at the idea of, yes, there's human freedom, but in a sense, it's human freedom in a causally determined world. And th there's a value morally in the sense of freedom, but it's not clear. You know, he, he also cites creativity. With Einstein, he's, he's, it's a little bit more than moral, but uh, it's not a fully developed idea. He does think there might be another kind of causality that we can look at things outside of simple observations uh, and, uh, and measurement of effect, that you can have indirect sense of causality. And that's what he's looking for. So these are real controversies. And I tell you, they do get at the, this does go at this, I think, at the core of everything that went wrong in the 20th century. That increasingly this idea that the human mind was at best, had a schizophrenic relationship to reality. The, we have the illusion of creativity, but we don't know it. And this, there's a certain kind of, I think, imprisonment in this idea of completed and perfected is the only thing that's true. And I think, in one sense, that's why Lynn made this point about don't, this idea of completeness is a real problem. Now, if you think about it, from our standpoint, if the world is anti-entropic, and we know that it is, then obviously completeness is a fraud. The universe could never be completed. And that's as simple as Philo's argument against Aristotle. If it were completed, it would be dead. It would be the end of anything's mission in the universe. So a lot of times what we get trapped into is trying to give people a perfect picture of our knowledge of the universe. When what you want to give them is a sense that indeed human knowledge is quintessentially the process of constant imperfection, of constantly imp improving the imperfection. But that's the nature of the universe. That's a better standard of truth. The seeming truths of a formal system could not be true about this universe. They're all false. There's no axiomatic geometry. So I think it, it, it's a real trap. But you have to realize this whole idea of artificial intelligence is based on this. It's really based on the idea that we limit our, what we call intelligence to what's computable. So it doesn't surprise me that it turns out artificial intelligence is still on people's radar screen when it's, it's been proven to be wrong for decades, for centuries, for millennia. I mean, Parmenides proved it was wrong. I mean, Plato's Parmenides. But this, this idea that you need perfected knowledge traps people, or at least it's a way that the oligarchy can trap you. Yeah. Well, one thing I was telling somebody is, well, think about how this worked. You, you, some of you may, I don't know, may be old enough to remember. After the wall fell in 89, and the Soviet Union fell in 91, well, you, you had this famous case of Francis Fukuyama, the end of history. 
The, what was the idea? There had been two systems, the communist Soviet system and Western free world capitalism. And the Soviet system collapsed, the free world system won, and of course that was the only system that existed, and so that was the end of history. Everything else was just working out the hegemony, and this is true, it was a book by Francis Fukuyama. It was entitled, The End of History. Now, at the same time, a little bit later, there were books written on the end of science. Mm -hmm. That in a sense, the victory of the free market system proved the victory of empiricism. And therefore, we had already come to all the things that could be empirically discovered, at least as far as principle was concerned. And therefore, we were at the end of science. That's what they teach in music. They say you cannot come up with anything new. You can just rearrange. Yeah. And, you know, what could be more existentially stupefying than this? Yeah. Now, you wonder why the culture, that's what you need. See, this is the pessimism. The pessimism in the culture isn't just, I believe, there's going to be bad outcomes. You get it, sure, you get it in the organizing, the typical populist. We're always going to lose. We're always going to lose. But think about how much more profound a pessimism it is to think that there's nothing that can be there's nothing new to be learned in the universe, not fundamentally. There's no, there's no process of discovery. I mean, what, what, what else could make people it's sort of permanent depression? <laughs> Life is just, I mean, this is what happens. This is the, there, you, don't, you don't develop ideas that move things into the future. It's the end of the simultaneity of eternity. It's the end of a soul. It's the, end of, it's the end of everything. It's complete death. It seems like the bad strike is a rejection of that. Because it, it seems like it's not just you know, the, the layers of the intelligentsia and, and top layers of science, but that has an effect throughout the entirety of the yeah. culture. Because when you talk to somebody on the street or anywhere, the standard of truth for the culture from the degeneration of the educational system throughout you know, yeah. for the longest time creates it to where we, if you were to run that test with somebody on the other side of the screen, they'd probably sound like a computer because our culture is so degenerate. Yeah, that that's true. To, you, that is part of what happens. You, know, it, you can actually test if you try one of the Turing test, uh, the yeah. online Turing test. It is hard to tell if you're talking to a computer or somebody else on the uh, somebody who just speaks chat speak. Yeah. You're turning people into that. You turn people into that. If you ask somebody to do to do poetry and they spew out a little bit of rap poetry, that is something a computer could turn out. Or the case a little back of when there was Schiller's birthday or something like that in Germany, there was this televised event. People recited Schiller, but they may have been robots. They couldn't. Yeah, you can't really recite it. No, it's, 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 a, it's a, a, a complete sense of a dead, ended, look, this is, green, this is the green movement. I mean, science is evil. Science is an effort to change the universe by human beings, and the universe should not be changed. Yeah. The human, they view human consciousness as a kind of disease. It's a, it's a virus. You know, you could get this. In, it, it, human consciousness becomes a burden. It's a disease. And we, we impose it on nature. So do you think maybe to get at this mass strike is it, as a phenomenon, it's a rejection <laughs> of that? Yeah, because it's a rejection of the idea. That, look, the, you're saying to people, you have no purpose. You have no reason to be here. We treat you like animals. And people react to that. They say no. I think there is, and I think you do have in the United States, though you have different forms of it elsewhere. There is a sense in the concept of what the relationship is between the republic and the citizenry that no, you, at least you have a claim to a certain kind of humanity. You, you, there's, you, you cannot be, society should not be structured from the standpoint of death so that some people get to control more pleasure and the others have to serve that pleasure. So you can break that. And it is an attack on that kind of pessimism. It's just, it's just inchoate, and we have to be clear about that. It's, it, it's not 
conscious of where it wants to go. You sort of have to treat it like, uh, it's sort of like a child who knows that it has a right to be an adult, but it's still a child. And you have to sort of mature it a little bit. You have to make it know what its purpose is. You have to tell it right from wrong. It's a noetic phenomenon. Yeah. Right. Right. In one way, if you look at the mass strength from the standpoint of like educating a child, at a certain point, you do have to tell the child, this you can do and this you can't do. There's right and wrong. You at least have to learn what's right and what's wrong and to differentiate it. You can't just lash out or you can't just play with anything. You know, it's like the child, at a certain point, often a child, maybe out of real genuine curiosity, you know, does some wild thing with the dog or the puppy. And you have to say, well, it's okay to do these things, but you shouldn't do it with the puppy or with your sister. <laughs> test the laws of gravitation. Oh, yeah, right. Don't test the law of gravitation with your sister, right? <laughs> Science is good, but don't do that. And so with the mass strike, you sort of have to say, okay, you're right to be angry, but you have to know what to be angry at. And sometimes when you do that, you get a very bad response. They get angry at you for telling them that they can't do what they want to do. But it, it, think about how much it's like dealing with a child. All right. All right. Oh, go ahead. What you said about um, the uh, the invisible aspect of the mass strike is something that comes prior to the effect showing up on the street or something like that, and it's something that doesn't go away just when you don't have the effect and the headlines for any given day. It, the psychological reality of it is more real than the physical reality of it, mm -hmm. and. Um, I mean, we were, yeah, we were having, like, for example, Michelle and I were discussing, Lynn had this thing about the uh, American Revolution as the example of the mass strike. And Michelle and I were trying to get to the bottom of, okay, where are you going to, how are you going to, how are you going to trace this back? Like the, the first shot at Concord or something like this. How do people, how do, uh, bad historians tend to trace this thing back. They just try to add up a lot of uh, unrest or something like that. But it's a much more profound question, and it's the same kind of question as being able to situ situate yourself in the period, in the political period now. Um, and I think the similar, the similar kind of question to get at, which, for example, the, the example of the, ma of the American Revolution, What's the psychological reality, the reality of it, which is much more real than the, the shooting war reality of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, look, take, take the, take, I, I don't know what, what Lynn exactly means, but take, in a certain sense, I, I, I like to work backward from the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. And of course, from the famous <laughs> thing that everybody says it was taxation without representation. Now, if you look at the list of grievances, taxation without representation is like number 17. Mm -hmm. And the, what are the actual grievances that they begin with? The inability to associate, the inability to develop, the inability to carry out trade and commerce, and so on and so forth. They're talking about, they're really reflecting back to 1763-65 when the British East Indies Company comes in, and they're told they can't develop manufacturers. They're told they can't develop you know, their own uh, uh, industry and manufacturers and even agriculture and so on and so forth. And so that's where Franklin and others decide it's going to be a revolution and not a reform. And then that's reflected in the willingness to take up, and you'd have to know, go a little before, work back from there, and you would see that this is a mass strike, not a kind of, you know, give me my money reaction, which is what they do with this stuff. Like, 
in a sense, if you look what they what what happened with this period this summer, okay, you had a mass strike phenomenon that completely shocked the British, the American establishment, the media. They didn't know. In one sense, the media was tailing it. They they knew they have a problem. They have to tell you the news, and people were free were were shouting down congressmen and starting mini riots across the country, and they had to report it. And then they realized this was a problem. So in a sense, they hijacked it. They, first of all, within about, Lynn said they were slow to react. Within about two to three weeks, they began to organize their own town meetings. They began to stuff the meetings. You know. And by getting, the trick was, by getting everybody focused on the mass strikers at these meetings, as they began to control the meetings, People's perception was they were controlling the mass strike. And they used that to try to demoralize things. Then, of course, the congresswomen met, met back, and then the idea was, well, since there's no town meetings, that really is the end of the mass strike. The problem that they face is, at this point, they're attacking the American population at an existential level. On the health care, a big mistake, because people do legitimately get angry at the idea that they're going to be treated like cattle. And there's enough left in the American population to fight back against that. Then you've got this, this mo most recent escalation around this idea that they lied about the jobs, I, that there's five million job losses, that you know General Motors is not going to be saved. And so what you're finding, in the, what we're finding by being out there is that impulse still exists. In some ways now, we, we, it's up to us to find a new way to, for the population or help the population express that. You know, what's really interesting is, um, so I, I, I looked at a few of these uh, media clips where they do like an entire you know, special, so to speak, on the mass strike where they send out you know, one of their lead reporters you know, showing up at various events where there's a mass strike, and they're 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 interviewing the the mass strikees, the mass strikers, and it's like, what what are you what are you mass striking about? What are you what are you here protesting? And then people will say various things, and then and then the the reporters would trap them. It's like, okay, so you listed this, this, and this. Yeah. What are what are you what are you really for? And they're like, uh, the war in Afghanistan. You know, so so they so they give the sense. As if, as if the mass strike has no idea what they're doing. Right. And uh, exactly. That's that's the type of direction we have to like. They reduce it to issues. Yeah. This point that they reduce it to, oh, you don't like this part of the health care bill, you don't like that part of the health care bill. Then they have this idea, well, there are no death panels. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Everybody knows there's no death panels. And indeed, there are death panels. <laughs> so you know, but the, the idea is reduce it to issues. We have that one good example, I think, uh, that was reported by um, Nick. There may have been other examples, but uh, where we went to this congressional meeting of this guy McKeon that had about 1,000 people. And even though people were angry, they did manage to keep it, uh, you know, uh, I don't like this part of the health bill. I don't like that part of the health bill. And so it was degenerating. And as it, this, way, and this is what you often have. People came in properly lit. But if you let them discuss it at this level, they demoralize themselves. Because they don't know the answer to this question. They, well, I, what if we don't have this? And how do you do a single payer? And blah, blah, blah. you know, the public option is good, the public option is bad. And people get demoralized. Now, what we did there, Nick and Cameron in that case, is they did get up and they said, well, wait a minute. The issue here is destroy this entire bill. There's nothing good about this bill. We're not going to debate the uh, the points of the bill. The bill is rotten and it should go. And that got a big, then people sort of got themselves back and then they hit this, the question of the bailout. Uh, I forget what I was, the bailout was a big part of it. And then people sort of remembered why they came to the meeting. <laughs> it's a good case of platonic memory. <laughs> oh, that's why I came. <laughs> And that's really what Lynn means. That's what we have to do all the time. What happens is when we get under it, we kind of get, oh, how do I answer that? And what do we say about the public option? And what is a single payer? And you know, blah, blah, blah. And it doesn't function. We're there because the whole bill is a rotten killer bill. 
We've got, a, we've got a financial system that's deader than a doorknob, and it's going to kill people. And that's why you're angry. And, they, and isn't it funny? You have to tell people why they're angry. Now, sometimes they get angry at that, but <laughs> <laughs> fundamentally, they want to be told, oh, that's why I'm angry. Gee, I don't know why I'm so pissed off. They stay that way long enough, they get depressed. Then you have to say, well, this is why you're depressed, because you were pissed off. <laughs> and you forgot why you were pissed off. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I just wanted to bring up one other thing that I thought was worth talking about. Um, in the intelligence call two days ago, I guess, we had this discussion with Lynn, and there were, um, I think this was somewhat reflected in the lead of briefing the following day, but it was, it was very provocative to me. Uh, there were these reports, which were all admittedly very terrible reports about crisis in nursing homes, crisis in, um, uh, I forget what the, other, what the other reports were, but Lynn's response to it was the most provocative to me. He said, we have to have this, we have to be able to think in, certain, in, a, in, a, in a way where uh, we, all of these things, although they are admittedly terrible, none of them should take you by surprise because uh, none of them are, it's, it's as if all of them have already happened and the ones that are yet to come have already happened as well because they're all the results of decisions that were made either at the end of Franklin Roosevelt's life or at the moment that Kennedy was killed or in 1987. And all since these decisions were made, uh, all of the effects of them have an effect already occurred. They might not yet have happened, but chronologically, but they're already there. And you have to get people, you have, we, the way that we have to communicate this to people, and I think this probably intersects with the same kind of discussion we were just having, um, is that people have to be able to have, to look at it from above in that sort of way, so that it's not just everything that sort of occurs on a day-to-day -day basis is an outrage, and I'm going to respond to it like that. But uh, you have to expect that, there, that everything will occur unless the fundamental decision that was made is reversed. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was a very provocative idea on um, yep. just how time works overall, and the propagated or the, the propagation of effect over even many generations, which hits yep. a generation. I mean, there is a simultaneity. I was joking around about how a fixed formal system, if you make that the whole world, it's dead. But it is the case that from a, the standpoint of Lynn, what Lynn talks about in history, you set a, if you set a totality into motion, you're going to create crises. And you've done it the moment you set that into motion if there's no correction. This is why the question of freedom is the interesting question. Because in a sense, the world can go ahead in two different directions. We always have the potential to act, to change the court, or we may lose it, but we, we, we certainly have many points at which we can change the direction of history. But if the moment Roosevelt died, look, it, I think it's even interesting to go back. And you get a sense that in the population, there was a tremendous fear about what the consequences were of Roosevelt dying. They knew that this might be a total change. I mean, Roosevelt had a Westphalian outlook. He was preparing a certain approach to the United Nations. He had a whole approach to colonialism. He, went to, he already had plans to gear up US industry, to convert it to peacetime production for the colonial world. It was all there. He'd stated it in various points. He was he, So when he died, it's as though that, that pathway might be cut off, and it was. And indeed, in 1987, when look, Greenspan was the biggest opponent of Glass-Steagall. He hated Glass-Steagall. Now, it's a little complicated, because Volcker supported Glass-Steagall. And Volcker's a monetarist. So Glass-Steagall by itself is not the end of the only solution. Lynn's view is you have to implement Glass-Steagall, but to get to the four power agreement the, the blue-collar development, it's, you know, the, the infrastructure projects, you have to turn everything upside down. But we do need Glass-Steagall. And um, you know, uh, uh, Greenspan fought it. Every, he was, I would say, the main driver 
behind overturning Glass-Steagall, even though Summers was the guy who signed off on it, was Greenspan. And what was Greenspan? He represented this, you know, Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, uh, you know, pure free market outlook. So these things get set in motion. And we have to realize that's, we have to get across to the population, these are the consequences of the decisions you made. You've got to change the way you're doing things. I mean, another way to look at it is, you know, I, I actually was, I didn't do this, but, um, well, anyway, I was going to uh, approach partly the triple curve from some, somewhat this standpoint. I mean, in a way, the triple curve is two different directionalities. You know, it's one integrated function, and you can't look at it any other way. Every step of the way, as you stay on this triple function, you're, you're charting a course for history. That physical economy is going to collapse. That means you're going to have social upheaval. And indeed, the, the, the hyperinflationary, we have hyperinflation. That monetary aggregate curve is reflexive of the reality of hyperinflation. When it breaks out is another question. It's going to break out. Now, it may break out in just a collapse of the dollar, because in effect, a collapse of the dollar is hyperinflation. And that, that may be the more likely way for it to come out. But this already exists. We're gonna, that, that physical economy is going to go down and down and down under these conditions, and nothing can stop it. And indeed, the more it goes down, the more the financial aggregates will tend to deflate. And the more it tends to deflate, a monetarist will pour mon more monetary aggregate into it in what, he th in what they think is the effort to keep the financial aggregates up. So it's a, it, 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 that's exactly the kind of thing Lynn means. This is a reality now. It, it's the reality under which we function, under which political decisions are being made. Look, the whole health policy is being driven by that triple curve. All you have to do is get this idea of bending the cost curve. And that tells you the whole truth about everything. Forget I want insurance for people. It's all a lie. Under those conditions, that's the only thing that's on their mind. So yeah, I think that in some ways you have to live with the stunning realities of what Lynn forecast and of what he keeps saying about certain things. You know, the, the April the 12th, 1945 was a radical change in direction. Not because, in a sense, not simply because Roosevelt died, but because Truman was brought in. And keep in mind, Truman was forced on Roosevelt. People, there's a certain sense in which people don't totally understand it. First of all, I think a big issue was Roosevelt was uh, uh, he was suffering. And I don't mean mentally. I mean, I think Roosevelt was marshalling his energy and trying to keep himself alive. And you can say that was a certain <coughs> mistake. Because in a sense, by capitulating on the Truman thing, he opened the door. But he was under enormous political pressure. I mean, he was basically being told that the Democratic Party would revolt against him if he insisted on Wallace and didn't sign off on Truman. And despite a lot of the controversy, Roosevelt wrote a letter that said, my preference is Wallace. He had earlier threatened to walk out if they didn't put Wallace in. But then he finally said, my preference, I want it clear, is Wallace. This has been twisted in certain respects. But there's no doubt that that, that statement existed from him. But he, he was told, in fact, one of the people who told him was the head of the Kansas machine, which is where, uh, yeah, which is where uh, I mean, Missouri machine, which is where um, uh, Truman came out of. And he was told, if you don't, if you put, insist on Wallace, really the way it was put is if you insist on Wallace, then you're going to lose a good chunk of the Democratic Party. And at that part, point, his majorities were not that strong. His lowest vote total was the 44 vote. There was a big anti-communist operation being run. And the Congress was not all that stable. So he was being told he was going to get a revolt on part of the Democratic Party. And that's why he gave in. And that's why you got Truman. And that came from people like James Burns. And this was a pure Anglophile 
operation. That really con continued the things that were done in the late 30s against them. But that's, so that was the dynamic. This was the British comeback. This was Wall Street coming back. And so that, it, it was a radical turning point. And I think Lynn made this interesting point that a little that I hadn't heard him make before was that in, in a sense the British were upset that MacArthur was the figure in Asia, that he had won the Asian war and they didn't want that. So they used the bombs, which they which was which they did through Truman. Truman didn't even know the A bombs existed until later on, until the presidency. So they did, they, they put him in to do that. And then they ran the Korean War. And uh, Asian wars have been our, the bane of our existence. And that's what they did. And so that's, that's governed a great deal. And I think this also has to do with the idea that um, there's an interesting way in which Uh, this whole question of the Pacific is not unimportant in this. That, 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 that you know, in, the, in American history, there's a whole grouping that has seen, while they, they respect our European traditions, their view is away from the European oligarchy, i.e., an orientation to, the, to, the, the, to uh, developing the continent and moving across the Pacific. In a sense, as a way of sort of a back door to come in to, uh, uh, to destabilize the European oligarchy. And I think MacArthur was in that tradition. I think so, Rosa... John Day, Jay, and John Quincy yeah. Adams, they put this there. They want yeah, to that's them. the view. And, and I, Roosevelt had to deal with the European... He, Roosevelt saw the European theater as crucial to winning the war. But he also saw the liberation of the Asian colonies as the key to the future. So 